and welcome to the Rawls College of Business Center for Sales and Customer Relationship Excellence webinar, Women in Sales Leadership, featuring Amy DeChico, Senior Vice President, Revenue Operations, Business Development with FedEx Office. We now welcome Dr. Atul Parvatiar. Good morning. Thank you very much, Julie, and good morning to everyone who are in, from the United States and Good evening to those who have logged in from Asia and good afternoon to people who are from Europe. Welcome to our next webinar on women in sales leadership. Uh, we have an outstanding speaker today, Amy DiCicco. And uh, before I invite her to speak, let me first and foremost introduce to you our Dean, Dean Margaret Williams. Uh, with her leadership, we are in a position to really take a, one of the pioneering steps in celebrating the success of women in sales leadership. Um, Ma professor Margaret Williams is a professor of management as well as the Dean at the Rawls College of Business at Texas Tech University. Uh, let's welcome uh, Dean Margaret Williams. Dean Margaret Williams, please. Thank you, Atul. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to welcome all of you to this uh, webinar today. And I want to thank Atul for his vision for the center and also for the series on women in sales leadership. I also want to thank Carlton Whitehead and his family for their ongoing financial support of this series. It's very important to the college to have their support. I also want to thank uh, the team that is helping put this webinar on both in front of and behind the cameras, including our facilitators today, as well as our uh, tech team. Uh, we can't do it without them. And Amy, I wanna welcome you and thank you for being here, sharing uh, your experiences with us today. We really appreciate that. I did wanna say just a few things about women in business um, and women in sales leadership as well. The college enrollment, the women enrolled in colleges in the US today are approaching 60% of the total of undergraduate students. Here in the Rawls College, I've recently been looking up some of our statistics and there are 34% of our undergraduate student body is women, which is very distressing to me because I believe that the business world needs the skills, the talents, the perspectives that women can bring to business. I also believe that business is an excellent way to prepare for a career in almost anything. Uh, people are beginning to talk about the 50 year career. Uh, we all know that, that you will change industries, change jobs, change uh, organizations many times over the course of that career and business is a great foundation for that. So I know I'm probably speaking to the women who are studying business on this call, but if you are one of those people, uh, stick with it, uh, encourage your friends, your sisters, your family members, your cousins, your nieces uh, to consider studying business. Uh, not only is business great for you, but you are great for business and we need we need more people like uh, Amy uh, coming into the business world. So again, Amy, thanks for being here. Looking forward to your comments. Farzan and Alejandra, thanks for facilitating. And I will toss it back to Atul. Thank you very much, Dean Margaret Williams. Uh, you have been a leader yourself and have really you know, helped the college as well as all of us think more about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And women sales leadership is one in that direction. And uh, I'm very, very pleased that we have today uh, my, two, my two colleagues who will be moderating the session, Dr. Ferozan Irani Williams and Dr. Alejandra Marine. But before that, let me, let me introduce to all of you our distinguished speaker today. And our distinguished speaker is Amy DiCicco. She is the Senior Vice President of Revenue Operations and Business Development at FedEx Office. Uh, from that point of view, she is the Chief Revenue Officer. As Senior VP of Revenue Operations and Business Development at FedEx Office, Amy guides the strategic direction and vision and innovation of commercial sales, e-commerce, and product development for our company. She leads the FedEx Office 
teams focused on the customer experience from end to end, from trusted and strategic business consultants to teams who develop and deliver physical and digital solutions that enable the success of the company's commercial, retail, as well as small and medium business customers. I'm going to let her speak more about her business, but before that, I must say that Amy has been a 25-year veteran of FedEx uh, across multiple operating companies. She has worked to help make the organization an industry leader in the commercial and printing marketplace. She's a trailblazer from finding talent in unusual places and faces to beating breast cancer and helping others along the journey. She is unapologetic in bringing the whole self to work, sharing firmly that her profile, her priorities are faith, family, and health, and leaving lasting impact on those she encounters both personally and professionally. I think you will enjoy listening to Amy today. And let me kind of uh, request Amy for her opening remarks before I bring a request for Dr. Ferzana Rani Williams and Dr. Alejandra Marine to moderate the discussion. Amy, welcome. Well, thank you so much, Atul, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone um, around the globe that's joining us. Um, I guess first and foremost, I just want to say thank you for this opportunity. Um, anytime I get to bring the things that drive me all together in one place um, in a forum like this, whether it's, you know, it's sales, it's supply chain, it's leadership in general, and then, of course, it is women in leadership. Um, the, uh, the idea that we don't have a fair share of women changing the trajectory of our business world um, is something that at this point in my career, um, I've reached 29 years, you know, and I am still as passionate every day in, in the, the people and the customers that we serve across the globe at FedEx. I have become equally as passionate in helping to ensure that we are opening the doors and bringing up the next generation of women um, in, the, in the business space that can help us lead to even bigger and brighter places. So um, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity uh, with all of you. I like to look at synergies. When I, you know, I come from FedEx, uh, I started out in the transportation part of the business. So supply chain is kind of what raised me in the business world. So I love to look for synergies. And um, I love the fact that your, your motto um, that has you from, you know, at Texas Tech from, from here, it's possible. At FedEx, we believe that, you know, from where we stand, it's we take our, our customers and our clients from, from where now meets next. And so it, it, those two synergies together um, uh, got me even more excited about thinking about where the conversation could go this morning, what some of the questions may be that come up. So again, grateful for the opportunity and um, thrilled to be here. Thank you very, very much, Amy. Let me now request our two uh, esteemed colleagues, uh, Dr. Alejandra Marine. Dr. Alejandra Marine is a, an assistant professor of practice in the area of marketing. And she has been also a mentor to many uh, innovation hub companies, uh, startup, startup ventures. And uh, she is uh, going to be one of the moderators and the other person is going to be Dr. Feruzan Irani Williams. Uh, Dr. Dr. Williams, uh, Dr. Irani Williams is also an, an associate professor of management and uh, studying women leadership is also part of our passion. So with uh, these two distinguished colleagues of mine and the distinguished speaker, Amy DiCicco, I'm going to leave it to the two colleagues to have the discussion about Amy's career, as well as what she sees as ways in which women in leadership can teach us a lot of, lot of things. So with that, uh, take it away, Dr. Alandra Marie. Thank you, Atul. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are very also excited to be with you, Amy. Thank you so much for the time. So to, to, to start the conversation, as Atul mentioned, you have been in, in, in FedEx for more than 25 years with different positions and you have been working now moving up um, in, the, in, in, in the company. Very, very exciting um, career path. Could you share with us, could you describe uh, to us 
the journey that you had had in FedEx? Um, certainly. You know, first of all, I, I want to say I did not start out with my job right out of college, two months out of college, um, assuming I would be with the same company 29 years later. You know, that, that was not a... <laughs> That was not, um, uh, I, I didn't have it all that put together, right, that I, that I had this all planned out. Um, I needed a job. So, you know, being brutally honest, I needed a job. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I started out, I got a job. I, I should say that I went to college. I was a, a very rare female at the time in a STEM track. Mm -hmm. I, my first love is science and my second love is math. Um, but I also came from a very um, working class immigrant Italian family who didn't have a college savings account. And when I started looking at the realities of my career path and the longevity of school and student loans that it possibly could take in, in those tracks, I picked up a business minor on top of the um, on top of the science track that I that I began on in chemistry. I did that. To the opening statements by uh, Dean Williams, I thankfully, from watching my father be entrepreneurial in his path, um, realized that whatever I did in business could in, could in, it, business could inform whatever my next steps would be. Um, and so I got a job in customer service. That's what was hiring. It was not a lot of money. If I can just tell you, it's burned into my brain. I made fifteen thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine dollars a year. That was my starting salary, and I, it was it was money. I was good. I had health care, and I, I could buy a car. That was like checking the boxes for me uh, as as a person out of college at that point. But the reality is that when I got in the door, and I actually came to FedEx through acquisition, I worked then for a company called RPS that is now the very successful ground operation at at FedEx. Um, uh, I started to realize that I was talking to all of these different businesses across all these different geographies and places and learning about their problems. Cause you know, you're calling customer service generally have a problem, but under it started to, it started to click and I could tick and tie things that I had learned in my business classes in college. And I I enjoyed the process of solving problems mm -hmm. because if you can get past people yelling at you, what you're really trying to do is solve a problem, right? And so um, I got very good at doing that and a sales position, the lowest ranking sales position came open. Um, I interviewed for the job. I got told that I shouldn't because I was too young um, and so they wouldn't take me serious, but you know, comically, the, the place that they needed to hire somebody for was in Brooklyn, New York, and they couldn't get anybody to take the job. So they came back to me and uh, gave me the opportunity. My, my trajectory begins there, by the way, I want to weave this in on being a woman in leadership, because when I, when I showed up in, um, and, and, you know, this is a long time ago, but when I showed up there at the operation prior to it being bought by FedEx, um, the, the, the male leadership in the building met me, did not shake my hand, mm -hmm. laughed and told me that I wouldn't last two weeks. Wow. And I, wow. I, I just want to make the point that I'm here. Mm -hmm. They are no longer with mm -hmm. the company. Um, so, you know, first I, I, I don't like to lose a bet, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, but I got into sales in a tough environment. But I also got into sales in New York City, where I got to get behind the scenes of so many different businesses and businesses that had global operations that just happened to have a headquarters in New York City. So the learning that I got on how businesses run by learning to solve their problems through transportation and supply chain that is what opened up my eyes to the fact that while I love and still love dabbling in the sciences, mm -hmm. actually selling is a form of science. Math equation all day long as you're trying to solve P&L challenges for a customer. And I could bring it all together. I could learn about these businesses, be a big part of helping them succeed. And I'm a salesperson. I made a lot of money when it worked out well, right? 
and I got really good at it. So it worked out really well. And that just led to growth in leadership um, that eventually led to a relocation to where I live now, which is the Dallas market. Um, still in transportation as a director, where I got the opportunity to open up a, a new sales region and um, you know further my influence. About two years after that, I had the opportunity to move into an officer role um, at our at FedEx office. So our retail face to our, the FedEx client in the in, in North America for or in the U.S. for um, retail shipping, but with a a very strong print um, and, and communications arm that services our small and medium and, and, and corporate customers that very much align with the same transportation customers, right? So it, it's a, just a communication supply chain versus a package supply chain. Um, and I've grown into this role now where I, I run our all of the revenue operations functions. Sales is a huge piece of that function and still, of course, near and dear to my heart because it's kind of what raised me, if you will. Um, so that's a little bit about what got me here. Along, those, along that time, I will say that I took a four-year stint as a sales trainer where I stepped out of direct selling, and this is prior to leadership, and I stepped into a role that had me on the road a lot, that had me onboarding and training and upskilling all levels of our sales organization. It was doing that job that made me realize how much I wanted to be a leader because wow. investing in people and seeing them go be successful, that, that was the thing that transcended from, I want to be the super salesperson forever, which I loved, mm -hmm. um, to, gosh, I want to help other people be the super salespeople forever. And that's really the, 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 the trajectory that got me into thinking about leadership. Great. So uh, before going into you helping others, I want to go into the role models that you have had others helping you to, to get where you are. What can you tell us about important role models throughout this trajectory? Well, if you don't mind, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it from pre-work to work because Perfect. I think it all mm -hmm. tells, a, tells a story. Um, first of all, I, it's probably interesting but, um, or, or different maybe, but personally from just childhood, um, I was very, I was very lucky that our whole family settled in a five block radius. You know, that's just the way it was. And we're a very large Italian family. So I was in the middle of, I had grandparents, great grandparents, aunts, great aunts and uncles and tons of cousins. And um, there was, I got to see a lot of strength in humanity from a young age. I had a, an, uh, my grandmother um, had survived breast cancer when she was 35 back in a, you know, back then women died of breast cancer, just period. They told her she was going to die. She didn't die. She went on to have a lot of challenges from that scenario. Um, but I never saw her ever not be anything but confident and strong in the face of them. Um, and so I, I learned a lot of personal resilience from her it never stood in the way of anything else in her life. She was my, when I was a kid going to my grand, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother was like going to Disneyland for me. That's where I wanted to spend all of my weekends. Um, so her being ill at, at any point in, in her life, and there were many times, never held her back. So I saw strength in, in, in that. Uh, my father, was very entrepreneurial, most likely because he is very smart and doesn't like to take orders. So those two okay. things together, just, um, and uh, so uh, he, entrepreneurs fail a lot. That mm -hmm. is just reality. So I watched him go from businesses, you know, times in our life where businesses were doing great to, I mean, some very bad times in our life when they weren't. And he never stopped. He never threw in the towel. And so he retired on the backs of a successful construction business that he had built or painting constructing construction business that he had built because he kept going. So I, I learned that it's okay to fail mm -hmm. and keep on going and that the failure doesn't define you. It's the getting back up that defines mm -hmm. you. 
My, my um, godmother and aunt, my father's younger sister, was born with severe cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. She was the head psychiatrist at a psychiatric hospital. She put herself through school. She, and, and then I watched the progression of her disease become so bad that if you didn't know her very well, you could no longer understand clearly what she was saying. And she was forced into early retirement because of a disability. Mm -hmm. But I watched her find work. She kept forging a path and became the lead counselor for a very large church um, in our area so that she could continue to give back and do what she did well. Um, so I, in, in no interaction with my aunt, whose life was cut way too short because of her, her disease, did um, she I ever see any of her challenge or the things that made her different, stop her. We didn't talk about that. We talked about the next great thing she was doing. So I had that. Then in, college, in high school, I had an amazing, and, and I mean amazing, um, uh, teacher. Um, he was my science, my advanced honor science track teacher. And I was one of the few women in the class. And I always set the curve on the test. Mm -hmm. they, would always, all, they would always get annoyed with me. And I'd always ask the questions that got everybody annoyed with me. And one day in the middle of class, after I asked a question, he saw everybody getting annoyed with me. He said, DeChico, he said, you ask the questions that separate the men from the boys. And then he stopped and he said, well, I guess the women from the, the girls. He's like, you know what? You just separate that. You, you, you know what I'm saying? He's like, and let me tell you what, that's always going to make people roll their eyes. Don't let that stop you from asking the questions. Mm -hmm. And he's the one that actually helped me find a, a college that I could afford that had a great science program that thankfully also had a great business program. Mm -hmm. um, when I got into my work career, um, truth be told, my first few jobs, the people that were hardest on me were women, not men. Mm -hmm. um, and as I progressed, there was an incredible woman um, by the name of Mary Shelfer who hired me into that training role. She had a litany of people telling her to hire many other people, but not me. And the reason why is because I was young, I was female, and you can hear me here. I, I don't have a soft voice. Nobody's accusing me ever of being a wallflower. And I have very definite, you know, ideas. So those things came across as aggressive, uncontrollable, mm -hmm. um, you know, all, all the things that if I was packaged in a white male box probably would have come across as strength, you know, go getter. But for me, it was, could she be managed? Is she a wild card? Is she emotional? And, um, you know, I'm not those things. Mm -hmm. And so she saw through that. She gave me the job in training. And really that is what got me onto the stage with leaders to see past what they assumed and actually see what I was capable of. And then, um, you know, from there, it, we were bought by FedEx and through having to train on a larger stage, that larger sales organization, I, I caught the eye of a senior leader who was on the precipice actually of retirement this year. Um, his, he is our uh, senior VP of sales for FedEx Transportation, one of them, and his name is Dan Mullally. And that man um, is probably one of the biggest champions FedEx has for um, diversity, equity, and inclusion for women, for, for anyone under a DEI umbrella. And again, he saw me, I was still very young and uh, rough around the edges, but he saw through that. And he's the one that helped ushered me and up usher me into my leadership roles. Um, he, he was pivotal in being a sponsor that helped me connect from transportation over to office that took off my, my career from here. And I have to say my current boss, our CEO of FedEx office, Brian Phillips, um, almost his entire leadership team, our executive leadership team is, is primarily women. And uh, that, he, he sees so much of the value and what that brings. Um, so knowing that I'm never being, I'm never having to tailor my approach so that somebody forgets that I'm female and thinks about me as a leader, but that sees me as both and the whole package. And 
you know, I have that now in him and that has been a, a phenomenal thing. Um, so those are some of the people, you know, there's been many others, but those are some of the pivotal people along my career path. And as you can see, a majority of them are men, um, which I think is so important because I, I do think men can get lost in the conversation mm-hmm. around women and leadership, and they should not at all be separate things. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's how we make everything better together, in my opinion. Yeah, not isolation, but unity. Um, Amy, you, you have mentioned since the beginning of our conversation, the role of your family, you know, your, your, your dad, your grandma, your aunt. So of course, the impact of your upbringing, of course, has been very, very important on, on how the, your journey has evolved. When you look back, what can you tell us about those nuggets that were implanted now early on in your in your development that kind of have marked you and have imprinted I guess in your in your journey um yeah what can we share what can you share with us in terms of your upbringing if we kind of pay attention to that specific yeah. effect so you know I I think the highlights um for me first of all are probably most importantly I don't remember ever being told in any way by anyone that I could only do certain things because I was a girl, you know, and, and I I have to say, sometimes when you say that people assume, well, that you probably were born more like, you know, we used to, the word used to be tomboy, but you know, no, no, no. Let me be very clear here. When I was four and five, I would, I would wait with bated breath for Sunday night when my mom would wash my hair and set it in those like, yes, I'm that old, those pink uh, curlers with uh, sponges that I would painfully sleep in. Um, I only wore pants to school during gym day, which I despised. Um, and I grew up a trained dancer. You know, I, I, I still to this day, I mean, you know, my, my memories of being on stage and performing are some of the, the, the greatest of my, my younger life. Um, so I was very girly in, if you will, in some ways, but no, that there was never a, well, you can't do that because you're a girl or you shouldn't do that because you're a girl. So I was equally excited and at home in the kitchen with my great grandmother um, as my making my great grandfather breakfast, as I was walking with him to the, when there, you used to go to the post office and coming back and having him he used to read me from these very big hardback literature books. I, I, I don't even remember what it was, but I'm sure it was way past my age. And I'm sure it was nothing that was what you would assume you'd be reading to a you know, five and six-year-old girl. But he wanted me to know about everything in the world, not about my, our very little small sliver of the world. Um, and that's just the way it was. I mean, my dad had me lugging 50-pound tile boxes with him when he was redoing the bathroom floor, um, you know, from whenever I was in junior high and 49 pounds wet. There was never this distinction. So I walked away with, I guess there was no imprint that said, you can't do that, right? Mm -hmm. Secondarily, most people at that point in my family had not gone to college. So there was always an assumed education is number one. So I never had any, there was never an idea in my mind that that wasn't an option, right? And so, Um, That was number two. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, something I carry into my leadership still to this day that, you know, we laugh and my teams tease me that I'm a hard grader. You're you're all professors. And and so you you get that. But my my family taught me that you. You don't let anybody. Become less than what they're capable of being. I was not allowed to be and not in a negative way, not in a way that created anxiety for me, but just in a you know, you need to rise to your own occasion and everybody's own occasion is different. So I actually watched it play out that, you know, the things I was held accountable to were not things my brother was held accountable and and vice versa. And that's okay because I have a different gift set and skill set than he does or that anybody else does. So when I see people on my teams and I all through the years, I, I'm not going to set this one bar and tell everybody that's your bar. Because if I do that, I'm making it very unfair for some people, and I am not getting the best out of others. So 
So that was there. And then, um, you know, two more things I, I, I think are important. Number one was I was very loved, very much raised with the um, people are going to make mistakes. We are all human mm -hmm. and, and we can love through those mistakes and disagreements. We don't always have to dis always have to agree. We can disagree in kindness and love. We can debate all day long. And believe me, we're a loud family. We debate and it gets loud. That has nothing to do with our love for each other and our, our, our ability and to show up for each other. Mm -hmm. And I really have worked hard to create that within my teams and where I have influence in, in every piece of my professional career, as well as my personal life. And I will tell you that if there was one thing that I know that to this day, my father would ground me for, is if he ever heard me talking in a way about anyone that made it come across that I was better in any way than anyone. He, that, that was, I mean, there was no, you, you don't, there, there was no judgment about anybody or anything because his, his favorite, his favorite line to me was, you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. You, you just don't know. You don't know what, what you're going to do, what the people around you are going to do. When you have children someday, you don't know what they're going to do. We are all the same, fighting the same battles. And so you are never, no, your, your job title, money, what clothes you wear, don't wear, car you drive, none of that stuff matters to humanity, mm -hmm. right? Those are, those are things aside, they, they have nothing to do with who you are. Um, and so those are the things. Mm -hmm. And those things were just so beat in that um, they've become just who I am, I guess, and what I try to bring to the table without, you know, understanding that everybody brings their own mm -hmm. also, you know, so that that's part of the fun is putting it all those differences together and getting to a better outcome. Perfect. So thank you so much for sharing. Very, very interesting. A very strong family values. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for sharing that very personal aspect. So, so I guess that is a perfect segue to start thinking about or talking about these transformations that are important to you in what in your journey. Um, yeah, transformations that you have championed throughout the the the, the journey uh, in, in FedEx. Now all these all these years, what has been important for you and what has what have you brought you think back to your you know, journey your the transformations that you have kind of helped achieve so you know somebody asked just the other day in, in a in a forum that I was a part of you know why what is your why for being a leader and I I, I realized that it started being, I want to help other people, right? I want to see, help them be successful when it was all about a sales leader. But what took it to be broader than that for me was I, I want to make a difference. And, and you can say that, but what, what I, that really means is I, I, I want to continue to make something better. And, and better can be a lot of things. Either I want to make it better for the people involved. I want to make it a better outcome for our customer. I want to make it a better process. But I have this, this drive towards seeing something and, and being able to visualize it in a much mm -hmm. better place. And so that's actually what's led my career path. You know, I, I, I am not a person that has mapped out, this is the job I want next. I very much have a belief that you get into the job that you're in mm -hmm. and you transform based on exactly what I've said. Like, I, I think I can make this thing better and here's how. But then eventually I would get to a point where I would see a bigger version of, okay, I think this could be better, mm -hmm. but I, I can't, I can only slightly influence that. I can't real. I need to, I need to get to that next level so mm -hmm. I can really influence. And so that's kind of how my, my brain or my vision starts to work in terms of seeing something that could be transformed for people. Or So it could be an initiative. It doesn't have to be an organization. It could be just an, a, a workplace initiative like DEI. But I 
would tell you that I think so probably me, what I bring to the table in those situations is that number one, I'm, I, I, I have no problem with the um, calling out the elephant in the room, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, I'm not some genius that has come up with the idea that nobody thought of. I'm just the crazy person that will actually say it when nobody else will. And so, you know, I used to laugh about that, but now I realize I think that might be a skill set. It, it's called courage, mm -hmm. right? Courage is not being a, is, is, it has nothing to do with the absence of fear. It has everything to do with being willing to do something, even if you're loaded with the fear. That, that's courage. I mean, goodness, if I only waited till I wasn't afraid of things, um, it, my husband would laugh at that. I, I mean, I, you know, I don't even like to climb a ladder. So it would be, we, we'd be done from the beginning. But it is, it's really about, you know, when I feel so strongly that something needs to be addressed, I am willing to step into the fear and put it on the table. So that's number one, have the courage to actually say, hey, Houston, we've got a problem, right? Or, mm -hmm. or an op something could be better here. Um, number two, I, you know, being in sales has given me an innate skill set to get people that are talking over each other, around each other, saying the same thing in different words and thinking they're disagreeing, to bring conversations to a place where they can be productive. And a lot of times, that's also a challenge because when you know, you, you get your best outcomes really when you have diversity in thought. But diversity in thought also creates conflict and tension when people don't agree. And a lot of times people want to back away from conflict and tension so you don't get transformation. I'm a firm believer that conflict and tension is actually the beginning of incredible transformation. You just have to have somebody or some people that can help channel it appropriately and get people to, to how those combined thoughts make something stronger and better. So I, I believe I have a skill set to do that. Um, plus, you know, I don't go into anything with my title because my title means nothing. It, it's my, that, that's what they call my job. I mean, if you handed me a broom and told me to go sweep the corner, I would do that too. It, there's no, it, it's words on a page, the title. Um, so I very much try to be cognizant of also a skill set from sales, building that trust with teams or, you know, whether they're cross-functional or they're with, they're the one that I'm leading, you got to build that trust up front and create positive intent because things are going to get challenging when you're trying to transform. You got to remember people don't like to change. That's human nature. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's why selling is hard because what you're selling is somebody has to change what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And that's not, that, that, that's not always logical and rational. So how do you um, uh, build that trust, get people to not be worried to say the wrong thing around you if you're part of the conversation, but really get everybody to drop that and, and, and work together as one driving force. That, that is, no matter what it's been, transforming a, a, an organization or an initiative, that, those are the things I believe I bring to the table that have helped move things forward. And then let me just add a lot of people smarter than me, right? I love to have people that are way smarter than me to, to, to help build what, what that transformation is. Anybody that in a leadership goes in it thinking that they have all the answers has failed from the, the get-go. Perfect. Well, that's fascinating, Amy. I mean, your journey has been really inspiring and I especially appreciate you making the point about courage does not equal the absence of fear. I mean, it is the ability to speak out in spite of that fear. And, and I think that that resonates really strongly with me. Um, so kind of focusing on that, that aspect of it, you know, you, you work for a Fortune 50 company and you've had a sustained uh, growing leadership role within that company. What challenges did you kind of alluded to some of the challenges that you face uh, in that upward trajectory? How did you overcome them? What motivated you to keep going at times when it was probably really tough? Um, you know, I, I think for anyone, motivation is very individual, right? One of the things that I, I, I realized made me a born salesperson is that um, I'm a bit relentless. And, uh, you know, that is one of the things that, that helped when I believe in something. When I see a, an opportunity that I truly believe in, 
I don't look for the things that are going to stop me. I look for the, the, the ways to forge ahead. So, you know, there's always going to be challenges. I, I, you, you, you know, people make hiring decisions, just like I said, people make buying decisions when you're selling to them and it's not always logical. Um, some people like to make the hiring decisions because they want people that they know are going to be easy to, to and, and are going to acquiesce and tell them what they want to hear. Well, when I wanted a job and that was the hiring manager's perspective, I got to tell you, I'm not going to be their first, second, or possibly 15th choice. Um, and I've had that happen. And I've had that happen as I've gotten to more senior roles. And I'm going to use that one as the example because I, I, in a lot of my mentoring conversations, I share with people, you can't always change the situation. You know, we like to talk in these forums like everything is changeable. Like you can, no, sometimes the objection is true. Sometimes the reality is the reality. And, you know, in those situations, you have two choices. I had two choices. Am I, is there another, is there another place I can go in my career that's not there for now, right now, while that person is still making the hiring decision? Do I leave the company? Is it, am I not happy with what I'm doing anymore? And I'm so frustrated because that's all I, I, I want and I want it now. So I, I can go look elsewhere. Um, or do I, do I wait? Am I, am I, do, are there things I can still be doing here that feed me? And we'll see what plays out. In that situation, I actually chose the third piece. You know, when I, when I put it all on paper and I, I do that regularly, you got to weigh things in a non-emotional way on what the pros and cons are. Um, I waited and I, I had many people telling me, I don't know why you're doing this. This person's never going to leave. This is never going to change. One random morning, I woke up to an email that that person moved over to a different piece of the business. And more miraculously, the person that moved into the role is an incredible, strong female leader who doesn't want people that, you know, don't take any risks. And it, and, and it, it, it completely changed the tra trajectory of my future. So, um, you know, that's a situation where I, I, I didn't want to lead with, well, I just was able to change this and that because I wasn't. Other times... I have worked to change the mind of a person that was in the way. You know, you build credibility. You, you take feedback that people give you and you, you may not always agree with it, but there's always something you can learn. What about me or my approach is making this person feel that way? And then what do I want to do about it? Because maybe I come at this because of the way my, because my background is in sales, but when you're selling, you have to understand the individual that's making the decision. You have to understand their risk profile. You have to understand um, how they feel about information, too much, too little. You, you don't always agree with how they think about things. But as a salesperson, your job is to understand them and then reposition your approach to a place where it is more... Um, that they're more will, they're more, they feel more comfortable working with you. That's how I see all interactions with life. You know, I am not, I don't walk into a room and say, take it or leave it. This is what you get. I mean, there are parts of me, I, you know, you can tell me to talk slower and lower all day long. <laughs> That's okay. I've been getting that on my report card since I was in first grade. Good luck. Um, but the, the reality is that there are things about my approach that I know I can change. I mean, goodness, I just celebrated yesterday, 26 years of marriage. After 26 years, I can still see on my husband's face when I'm saying way too many words. <laughs> and depending on my mood, if I really am trying to get to resolution, I will dial that back. If I'm really, you know, it's whatever, I don't. So those are, those are just realities of how you um, work through challenges, business cases. You know, if I'm trying to get my CFO to approve something, I know she doesn't agree. I know what it's going to take. She wants to see profit. She wants to see revenue and she wants to see minimized loss. So that's incumbent on me to go get that done and be able to make a compelling case. Um, and so those are, 
I, I know it's a it's a it's a lot of different things, but I think that's the way the business world works. People want this one smoking gun, and there just isn't. There are these these all these peripheral things, and I think that's what makes business so exciting. And I also think it's why more women should be in it because let's face it, what how many women do you meet that are not having to manage fifteen different things at once at any given time, and you know, we tend to be, and, and I'm not, I, I don't love to speak in generalities, but there are many studies about women's studies that show our capacity for reading between the lines is very high. And between the lines is where the magic happens. So, so, you know, the, the, I like to lean into that. It's just another problem to solve. Well, that's awesome. I'm glad you brought up the perspective of women. So let me ask you this. What was it like being a woman leader in a field like sales and supply chain, both of which are traditionally extremely male-dominated fields? What was it like being a woman there? That's yeah, a great question. And you know, it's so different. Um, it's, 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 of course, changing, right? Um, but I did, there's one thing that I had to come to terms with first and foremost, which was that I was a lot of times the only, I was going onto a dock. That's where the selling was happening initially. So I'm, I'm going into a back dock and there's 50 men working on the dock. The, the woman was the receptionist at front, up front. I mean, th that's just the way that it was back then when I started selling. I had the choice. Is this going to really make me, um, is this going to create too much stress or can I just, so what? So what that I am the only woman in this environment? And you know, I, I kind of took it back to my childhood. I, I have lots of lots of male cousins, uncles, you know, whatever. They're, they're, we're all humans. We no, I'm fine. I'm sure these these men have women somewhere in their life at home, right? So I chose to not act on the fact that I was the only woman. Um, I so much so that I just got used to being to that scenario. To the point where when I wasn't that way, that's what took me more by surprise. But it also was a joy. You know, whenever I, whenever the owner of the company was female, that was joyful. Um, you know, uh, if you'll indulge me, one of my uh, one, a favorite starting out uh, earlier in my career sales call with a peer, we went in and to, to call on an import company in uh, Manhattan and the owner was a husband and wife, but the wife was in charge. And when we went in, she we went into her office and it was textiles that they sold. So it was just beautiful. And uh, her, her assistants were all the men. And I remember this clearly because it was my first cup of, of chai tea ever in my life that she sent them to go make, um, which by the way, ruined me because you know, Starbucks chai is not real homemade chai. But the point is, I remember most of that sales call, instead of being focused on the business, being like, I felt like I went into another world. Like, this is totally gender reversed. What's happening here? Um, but, you know, now you see a lot more of that, right? So first and foremost, it was not a thing that I made a thing. It just was something that was the reality. But I also, I, I have to say, I just said I was married for 26 years. I, I know when I tell my father, I'm like, hey, I got to tell you something. He will tell me, great, but don't start from birth. So I, I get that not all, that sometimes with men, less is more. So I did work to tailor my approach. But again, that's not making me less of a woman. That's, the, that's just, you know, the person that I'm across from and, and learning. Um, so, you know, it was a lot of those things, but then it was breaking down barriers too. You know, I had somebody promote me that, again, no longer with the company, but at met, many years before that talked about the fact that women didn't belong in transportation. Um, thankfully, he was open-minded enough and, you know, I kept going back and, and kept on delivering results and kept on um, being successful. And that kept on opening his eyes and his mind more and more and more. And that changed his mind. And he ended up with multiple women on his leadership team. So, you know, sometimes it's also acknowledging the reality that I'm dealing with somebody that is trying to count me out 
and I'm not going to let them, but I'm not going to let them based on the body of my work and my results. Well, that is fantastic. So you chose not to focus on the fact that you were a woman. You chose to focus more on the problem, the solution, the leadership that you could bring to, to resolving a problem, right? And so what would you say is your leadership style? I mean, as a trailblazer, how did you get people to rally behind you? Um, I think, I, I know, I don't, I try to never knowingly set a bar higher for somebody than I would set for myself. So that whole walk the walk, talk the talk, I, I don't know that I have a team ever that I've led that would say that I, I ask them to work to a level that I would that I don't try to exceed every day myself. Um, I also, you know, I am very direct in my coaching and communication and very in the moment, but from a place of intent, I, I, I really believe that I, that people know that it is that I want the best for them. It's not about me looking better. Um, I also try to make it a point to be there to fight battles with them, to take the lead whenever I know it's something that it's going to take me to make people know that I've got their back. Um, and the trust and authentic communication, I, I think is key. None of those things matter though, if as a leader, I can't paint a compelling vision. So I do think, and this is where I, again, think women have a leg up. Storytelling is so important in leadership. You have to be able to not just go out and, 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 and re-spew re the company mission statement or the, the goals that were on that slide that came down from corporate. You've got to be able to, to create a story that people can see themselves in to show them the vision and how those things, why they matter, what the individual work they're responsible for, how does that build to the greater good and, and why is it important? So I do believe that, the, that, my, that you know, I've leaned into that heavily all through my career. And you, I learned that in sales, right? You got to paint that picture to a customer to get them to, to, to want to do business with you. Um, so how do I paint a picture that, that, that just is so compelling of success that it makes a person want to do the hard things necessary to get there? Um, I think it starts with that. And you also mentioned the fact that you don't think men and women are separate. It shouldn't be only men or only women. It's like, we have to come together to do this, right? Yes, absolutely. I mean, sometimes, you know, I, I will say this. sometimes I'm so busy reading between the lines that I need somebody to just read the black and white headline to me, right? Like, it's just, stop me there. Um, and I, I, I absolutely think we bring such value when we think about things um, in that way. You, you need, gosh, you, you need the, the men in my career, you know, that I work for, around, with, that have given me incredible coaching advice from their perspective that I never would have been able to see on my own it, about myself, about people that worked for me um, and vice versa that, that have been open to allow me to do the same thing. Our outcomes have always been, it's way more than two plus two equals four, right? It's two plus two equals 40. So yes, I, I, I don't think this is about, we need more women at the expense of men and this is about, you know, the, the women and men that are already there realizing that we need more of both of us together. Um, and yes, we want to get to numbers in business that are more than only 30%. Because if, if you only have 30% of women in the business world, then you don't have enough of this in a group. That the numbers, that's just plain math, right? If you don't get to more of a a 50-50, then all through your ranks, you're not going to have that diversity of thought and opinion. And without it, you're probably not getting the best outcomes for you, your team members, or your customers. Great. Amy, this has been so great. Time is flying. Uh, let me remind the audience, we do have some time for uh, questions, and I'm sure Amy will love to get some you know, a different set of questions. So please, Share the questions in the Q and A. Um, we we will get to those. So, Amy, you you mentioned sales, of course. Health sales has been 
fundamental for you in your development. Um, looking back, if you need to reflect on, on the impact of sales as a launching you know, of a career, what can you tell us? And of course, in the audience, there are students choosing you know, how to start their careers, sales as a launch pad for a career. Um, yeah, what can you share with us about that? So, you know, I, um, I believe so strongly that sales is one of the most misunderstood professions mm -hmm. um, globally. You know, I just had this conversation with somebody yesterday where there are still people at all levels that believe that sales is a matter of, you know, being able to take somebody to lunch and, and have some fun and build a great relationship. And it all just, you know, maybe that was sales 30, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. That is not sales today. Um, salespeople today have to have an incredible ability to learn the inner workings of a business, understand the problems and challenges that are going on there that the people they're talking to either don't understand or are unwilling to, to actually put out there on the table, have to understand the financial impacts of the change that they are bringing forth to, to be purchased understand how you can help a company grow revenue, reduce costs, create efficiencies. That is a tall order. And by the way, it's a huge leap of faith because when you sell something, you are 99.99% .99 of the time, not the person implementing the solution. You're not the operator. You're not the manufacturer, right? So you are making a lot of promises. You got to believe in the company you work for. I am, that is part of the reason why I'm still here at FedEx, because I know that I am never going to be bringing to the table something that is going to fall short for the, for the customer. Um, but your ability to learn the, to learn the inner workings of business from a financial and operational and supply chain perspective, your ability to learn to, to build trust, credibility, to um, communicate, to storytell, all of those things matter in a boardroom. All of those things matter no matter what you go do. Um, you know, if I sit on a board for a charitable foundation, those things matter. I, I, when I sit on the board of my kid's swim team, those things matter. You know, when I'm negotiating homework with my 12 year old, those things matter. So sales is hard if you're really doing it right. But it is so gratifying if, if you are one of those people that are driven towards winning because it feeds that too. You know, you have to remember, and I, I do want the audience to hear this. I don't care how good you are in sales, you get more rejection then you get wins. That, that is the name of the game. So you do have to know yourself. You have to know that the, the rejection motivates you, that it doesn't defeat you. You know, that you're the person that's wired to figure out how to get to the next yes, because that's what it's all about. Um, but to do it, you've got to be your business acumen, your emotional intelligence, your communication skill, great salespeople, nail it on all three of those things. And to me, you can go anywhere from there. Um, you know, I didn't know when I was in sales that I would be helping to, that I would be leading developing our e-commerce channels, mm -hmm. product development, marketing, search engine optimization. I mean, I, I can learn and be effective as a leader in those spaces, primarily on the backbone of everything I learned in sales. Great, great. Thank you for being now, with such authenticity answering our questions. In terms of expectations for, we, for, for being a woman in a sales role, did you feel some, some sort of expectations for being a woman in a sales position in these di different uh, jobs uh, or responsibilities that you had? Um, you know, Yes and no. First of all, you know, yes, I mean, you're, you're cognizant of the fact that you're, the majority of your sales team is male. 
at least, you know, at that time, that's a, a lot of that is changing. You're cognizant that the leadership is primarily male. You know, you, you, you see those things, you, you, you live them. And when I was younger, you know, yes, th- some of those things became, should I act different? Should I talk different? Do I dress different? Um, but I have to tell you my, what I shared earlier about how I was raised, that they made those conversations very short lived because I knew myself that I can't do what I do best trying to be someone else. Mm-hmm. I've got to be me to do what I do best. Um, so I, I really believed, I guess, in myself and what I could do. And I, I, I to this day, I, I let my body of work be the biggest hammer that I swing in changing people's opinions about being the woman in the room. Um, and at that point, you know, people would say to me, trust me, when I was much younger, well, you know, you should maybe dress more con- by conservatively. Don't let them think that you're pretty. Well, that's ridiculous too. I, who, I, what, nobody's telling some guy, don't let them think you're good looking. I mean, you are, you look like what you look like, you know, and I, by the way, we're all beautiful. So this whole, um, those kinds of things I think are so dated. And when we talk about them in one way, they're dated because we shouldn't be having those conversations anymore. But in other ways, I still hear people telling me that that's what they're told. On those kinds of things, I firmly call BS. <laughs> if you can't, if you can't be you and you have to change your very appearance, and I don't mean coming to work in a bathing suit, okay? It's a professional environment. That's not what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. But if I can come to work in, in, in business attire that is inherently female, and somebody has a problem with that, then that's their problem, not mine. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's decide, you know, it's the, what are the things that are, are still true about today that you do take action on and, and understand, you know, I got to press harder into my body of work sometimes so that people for, don't let their preconceived notions mm-hmm. take over. Other times it's, that's, I'm not going to do something of mine to change that thought. That's their problem. And I got to just forget that it even exists because it's, it's not worth the energy. Being authentic. Yes. I mean, that's been such an inspiring and enlightening, enlightening conversation. Uh, we've been focusing on your past and the deep insights that you brought through your career journey. Let's look at your future just for a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. Where you see yourself going. You know, you've been, you've been really successful in your career so far. I would say that you're on a trajectory to enter the CEO role here pretty soon, whether it's at FedEx or whether at another organization. Um, what changes or transformations do you think you would champion at that level? Um, well, you know, I, I don't know what my future holds. Um, I just hold a lot of faith that it's the right answer. Um, but the, I I think I know at this point in my career, of course, it will always be whatever role it is to continue to evolve for the better, right. And, and find the ways that we don't want to become complacent. Complacency is what, what, what really holds anything back in business. Um, but the area of passion that I really know that I will always remain focused on now for the rest of my career is in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I am grateful that that is something that that FedEx is so passionate about, and and especially in a space like ours, which has in the past been traditionally um, male dominated, and in, in, you know as we've talked about, um, and that to me is so important. And it's it's again, it's women is just one faction of that, but. When I look back, some of the some of the things that have just fed my heart the most in my career is when there is a person that I can see has such innate talent and skill, and they are being excluded because of something exterior that is rubbing people the wrong way, is a preconceived bias, an unconscious bias in many cases, you know. Um, helping to break those walls down, to challenge the unconscious bias, to look for talent in the unexpected places. That is, you know, that is the motivation and the passion that I, that outside of the business transformation that is pure P&L type business transformation, that's the business transformation that I believe we all need to be focused on um, globally. 
uh, from this point forward. Well, that is fantastic. You're speaking to my heart here. This is awesome. And you've been kind of sharing nuggets of, of advice and tips throughout your entire talk. I wanted to see if you had some other, or not other, even if you wanted to build on or kind of finalize your set of advice to other professionals as they embark in their own unique sales and leadership journeys. Yep. I, you know, first of all, thank you for that. First of all, it is your journey. So what you just said there is key. If I would have based my journey on what my friends from college and my husband's friends from college were doing, I would have left FedEx a long time ago. Everybody was job hopping and telling me that I was doing it wrong because I could have gotten a raise quicker. Um, our friends laugh now. They're like, maybe we should have followed your trajectory. <laughs> and, it, you know, we just we joke about it. But the the you got to you have to know yourself. What is what makes me what what challenges me? What drives my passion? What do I care about? Seek out the, the business opportunities and the companies that align with those things, because here's the newsflash. Work is hard. Business is hard. You're, you're not going to find some place that is magically super easy and fun all day long. And you may, um, and that's awesome, but you, you probably won't also then get paid what you want to get paid. So, you know, you got to find that, that balance. So that's number one. Know what you really, what drives you. What do you get excited about? Not what everybody else is telling you. Number two, expect it to be challenging and expect challenges along the way. That's just, the, that's just reality, but the good stuff's on the other side of the, the challenges. So remember that. Most of the time we all stop too short and go in another direction. The good stuff's on the other side of the, the challenges. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, the last thing is be open to opportunity. As women, a lot of times, we will not take an opportunity because we think we aren't good enough yet or we aren't smart enough yet. Or Men don't think that way. Men jump first. I know I have 11 and 12 year old boys. They jump first. Mm -hmm. We need to learn if it's, if it's in your line of sight, if it's in your purview, if it is you know, something that you know, you, know you, you, could be, you could be good at, go get it and get good at it while you're doing it. Don't wait till you're perfect for something you're not even doing, you're never gonna get perfect at it if you're not doing it. So don't be let fear hold you back or, or this perfection idea that women get hold you back. You will grow into it if it's meant to be. Um, so those are probably three of them just to, just to kind of keep in mind, but you gotta let the path be the path too. I, I couldn't have planned this path, like I said, way back at the beginning. So enjoy the journey um, because it'll take you to way unexpected places um, and gosh, the good stuff is all in the unexpected places. That's awesome. I don't know about the others, but you've got me like raring to go. <laughs> well, I, I, I love, I hope, I, I hope um, uh, that I've, if it's just one thing that, um, uh, that I've done the same for the folks listening, um, you know, I, it's was the final thing I, I do want to say, if you'll allow me is it's kind of fun because I came to FedEx right out of college. I'm probably speaking with a lot of folks that are at that point in their career. Um, find a place, if not FedEx, find a place like FedEx, find a place where you can come and be who you are and bring your best and that there's always the next challenge. Because in reality, even though you can say I've worked for the same corporation for 29 years, I've actually changed jobs. You know, I went from multiple types of operations and even multiple pieces of di two different industries. Um, all within the same company. So I've been able to, to, to do what I want, where I want. It's global organization because I found the right place. Find the right place. You know, we'll welcome you with open arms. Trust me, we're always hiring. But find your right place because that's so important. Awesome. Great. Uh, I think we have a couple of questions. Uh, we have Lacey McBee. She, in terms of advice, she, she wants to know, or, or this person, uh, um, what is the best advice you were ever given and what is the worst advice? Hmm. That's, that's great. All right. So um, probably the best advice that I was 
let me think about that. Probably the best advice that I was ever given, it's actually not in the business world, but it was from my father. Um, and he told me that I would know if it was time to leave the company. Um, and that was any company. He, he, he told me, he said, you know, in kind of what I said already about things being hard, but he said, at the end of the day, you want to be in a place that values what you bring to the table. That doesn't mean you're always going to get your way. Certainly doesn't mean you're always going to get the promotion. We could have a two hour session on all the promotions I did not get. Let me be clear. Um, but so those things will happen, but you have to know when you are not being valued when your skill set and ability is not being valued. So that is a huge piece of advice. You, you, you have to be clear about the difference between, you know, a challenge or not, not getting the next promotion and being let down versus truly being in a place where you're not being valued. Mm -hmm. So that's number, that's probably the best advice. Um, I could write a book on some of the, the worst advice worst. <laughs> um, that, I, that I've been given. Um, but and, and all of it would sum up to times when people tried to change who I was at my core or my fundamental belief system, you know? And uh, I mean, I, the, the funny thing is I've been told many, many times in my career that I should never have conversations that tripped over personal things with people, their, their faith beliefs or political beliefs or things about their family or childhood. And I have to tell you that in the in building of trust first, right, with people, those have been where the magic has happened. And not just with team members, with customers. I mean, the magic has happened in actually in, in actually learning about humans. And so when we I think that's some of the most terrible advice in the world. On one hand, we tell people to bring them whole their whole selves to work. And on the other hand, we tell people you can't have any conversations that don't broach your personal life. Well, your personal life is your whole self. I, you know, I don't go home and, and whoop, I'm a different person. That doesn't happen. I don't have the energy for that to happen. You know, I am, that's not going to work. So I, that's all of that advice to me is some of the worst. The smart thing is knowing how and who and when those conversations mean something and are appropriate and matter. Great. And I think Ali, Ali has a couple of questions. I think we can cover. So what do you want to be remembered for that you haven't done yet? What do I want to be remembered for that I haven't done yet? That you haven't done yet. So something that you need to still do. <laughs> uh, uh, that you want to be remembered for. That's a fantastic question. But, you know, I don't, I don't know that that has anything to do with with work. Um, mm. Well, so, you know, I guess I haven't retired yet. Um, <laughs> someday when I retire, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I truly hope that when I retire, anybody that's worked with me or for me or that I've worked for will look back and feel like the time with me in some small way had a, a lasting effect. Mm -hmm. you know that whether it's whatever it has to do mm -hmm. with, that that is from a professional standpoint that's what would that's what it would be for me I, I hope that I'm working hard to achieve that awesome thank you thank you Amy at all any any question well thank you it has been it has been a very inspiring talk uh, and I I really must commend you Amy with the amount of grit you have you know whether you have got it from your family background, whether you've got it as a part of your personality or being to the sales arena. I think you have a lot of grit and that you really displayed how, how much of a determination you have in getting things done. And I guess that what speaks about, you know, being a, being a leader, uh, being a woman leader on top of that, having the compassion uh, as well as uh, being able to manage and maneuver through all the challenges that really is outstanding. I think, uh, you already gave very, very good advice to people, you know, and one of the most important things, there's a question that is there, which I thought you all actually answered by saying, what not to own is a problem and what to own is a problem. Sometimes, you know, things are there, which is not part of your problem, it's somebody else's problem, mm -hmm. and they impose it upon you. And that's the grit. That's the grit of kind of not kind of getting cowed down by problems of somebody else, but to, to maintain your own sanctity. I think 
uh, we greatly appreciate it and your your experiences your life journey has really been something which is inspiring for all the other people and i'm very sure our uh, uh, students uh, future leaders will all get inspired one thing you mentioned was also very very important that it's not about just the women promoting women as leaders it's about women being leaders and men celebrating the leadership which is very important what you bring to the table so greatly appreciate it good learning for all of us and thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us also thank you both professor ferozan uh, williams and uh, uh, dr alhandra marine uh, for this you know nice in uh, you know moderation of the discussion and to kind of getting amy to talk about her life experiences and i also want to thank uh, both julie das and uh, uh, matthew winfrey you know as always uh, julie das and matthew winfrey manage things so well behind the scene uh, and and as well as in front of the scene and also want to thank uh, uh, my colleagues in the marketing department uh, from april's uh, april's office who helped in terms of promote it thanks to all the people who participated in it and of of course i want to thank dean margaret williams for her leadership and for uh, coming on to uh, you know in, uh, welcome everybody as well as uh, professor carlton whitehead uh, and family carlton whitehead family for supporting this leadership uh, discussions and leadership speaker series uh, particularly with, for women in sales leadership so thank you very much and I, amy i want to thank also your colleagues uh, adam and uh, caroline and everybody else who helped facilitate the entire uh, uh, you know program so thank you and thanks to all the attendees so we we'll look look forward to seeing you soon on campus over here absolutely and happy homecoming to everyone um i guess i'll leave you with rakam thank, thank you, you. Thank, thank you so thank much you. <laughs> uh,